uh, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Connecticut River Conservancy's live stream. We're at episode 11. My name is Stacy Leonard. I'm the events coordinator here at CRC. And we're really happy to have you all joining us today and hope that you're staying healthy and safe during these challenging times. For those who are new to this event, live stream is our lunchtime presentation series we launched this spring where we bring our work and our rivers to you. Today, we're honoring World Fish Migration Day, a global celebration to raise awareness about the importance of free flowing rivers and migratory fish. World Fish Migration Day is held every two years in May, but we all shifted our plans this year, as you know. And this has actually offered us an opportunity to explore what's happening during fall migration. Today, we're honored to have two experts in the field joining us live and with video to dig deeper into the world of two important species of migratory fish in our river, in our river system, juvenile American shad and sea lamprey. A few details before we jump into the conversation. We are recording this presentation for later access and all of our live stream recordings can be found at ctriver.org slash live stream. I'll share that link and other resources in an email later today. We really welcome your questions and at, we'll field them at the end of the program. So please use the chat box. You can let us know where you're from for now and ask questions as we go along. And now today's presenters. We have Andrea Donlin and Ron Rhodes, two of CRC's river stewards, who will be chatting with Ken Sprinkle from the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Lael Will of Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea to lead the way. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stacy. Um, I'll be Andrea Donlin, river steward for um, CRC. I focus on the Massachusetts part of the watershed. I'm um, really happy to introduce Ken Sprankle, who has been a sta state and federal fishery biologist since 1994. He's been the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Connecticut River Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office project leader since 2009, with work focused on restoring and managing migratory fishes and their habitats in the Connecticut River watershed. Ken's work intersects with CRC in support and partnering in research and management activities and in the relicensing of hydropower dams. Several of our staff have helped him in the field with various fish and other monitoring studies, and we really appreciate his assistance also during many source to sea cleanups. Ken, thank you for joining us today. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Andrea, I want to thank uh, the CRC for their ongoing conservation work that many of you are familiar with um, and for making this event possible today. So as Andrea said, I'm the project leader for the Connecticut River Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Conservation Office. And uh, I work with many partners. This shows the agency emblems for the various state and federal agencies within the Connecticut River system alone that I work very closely with. And then we work uh, my office and others, we work more broadly within the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission at that river basin level ha with the Connecticut River um, crossing into four different agencies with different jurisdictions, obviously. And then even more broadly than that, within uh, the a a Atlantic coast dealing with these migratory fish, we have the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which the Fish and Wildlife Service is a member along with the other state uh, agencies along the East Coast um, to manage uh, a, a suite of species, um, mostly marine, uh, but certainly all of the migratory uh, anadromous uh, species and diadromous, including American eel. Um, and so we, we could never do the work uh, that needs to be done without partnerships, which include NGOs such as CRC, the Nature Conservancy, the power companies we consider partners in the work we do as well, uh, universities. And so partnerships and, and collaborative work is really essential uh, for what we, we need to uh, do. Could I have the next slide, please? So my talk today is gonna focus on American shad. American shad uh, are an anadromous species, and that means that they spawn in fresh water and go to the ocean to mature. They spend about 90% of their life in the marine environment 
And the species uh, has been a valued uh, resource in, in uh, North America and the Connecticut River for thousands of years. So Native Americans we know relied on them as a food resource. When the settlers first started coming over uh, to America, they also utilized them. American shad are recognized as a very important commercial fishery as well as a recreational species. And uh, with uh, also very important ecological roles, which we've come to appreciate more uh, over time. Certainly the, the resource agencies uh, are, are trying to better uh, get that perspective uh, for these species out. So they make important contributions in the freshwater environment, estuarine and marine, because they are utilizing all those environments at different times. The maximum age uh, for American shad, uh, currently we, we consider 11-year-old uh, fish as, as the maximum age. And interestingly, the world recreational uh, catch uh, size fish came from the Connecticut River. It's 11 pounds and four ounces. So that's, that's where the world record fish uh, was captured back in the 1980s. And populations north of North Carolina can uh, survive the, the rigors of spawning when they come back to their natal rivers to spawn and go back out to the ocean and recondition and spawn again. So that's called iteroparity, the ability to repeat spawn. Could I have the next uh, toggle? I've got another little I've got some different images. So there's a, the life history of American shad captured in that little image. And you can see, uh, again, out in the ocean, um, you know, they migrate there right now. Uh, the juveniles are migrating out, so they're age zero. Uh, they'll be one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three. They're, they're maturing out in the ocean. They're migrating thousands of miles each, each year off of uh, middle Atlantic states and, and even down south to North Carolina. And then in the summers, they're going largely up to the Gulf of Maine uh, to feed and, and grow. And so they become sexually mature. The females will mature uh, at age four or five. Males are, are three and four, a little bit younger. And uh, in the Connecticut River, our fish are mostly first time spawners. We're not seeing a lot of repeat spawners. So, so the males again, three, four, five, the, the females, four, five, six year olds. Um, and the females, um, as first time spawners come into the river, they have about 300,000 eggs that they're carrying and they'll spawn those eggs in batches. And those batches are released at 50 or 60,000 eggs over a period of every three to four days. And so that's, that's how they um, come into the river and spawn. They arrive in our, in our river system in the Connecticut River in very early April, sometimes late March. And, and most of the spawning is occurring around the middle of May uh, till the middle of June. The eggs that are spawned generally can hatch pretty quickly. It, it may be two to four days. It's all dependent on water temperatures, but two to four days. Then the yolk sac larvae develop. And as they use up their yolk sac, they need to transition to feeding. And much of that occurs in very late June to early July. And then those, those fish are termed juveniles and they need to feed. They feed and grow, of course, in the river system. And over a period of uh, roughly three months, they'll attain a size of three to four inches and they'll migrate out to the ocean then in the fall. Much of the migration has occurred right now because the water temperatures in the river are in the, in the 50s. And so that migration really starts to kick in when the water temperature gets in, into the lower 60s. Um, and you can see that little panel there now that was also pulled up shows that the range of American shad in, uh, in the United States, it extends from the St. John's River in Florida all the way up to the Canadian border. These fish return to their natal river systems. There's, there's not a lot of strain that occurs. So really about uh, the strain rate is on the order of 5% or less. So these fish are really going back to the rivers where they were, were spawned. And if I could have the next panel. That panel just shows you uh, one of the figures that helps explain the status of the resource along the East Coast. And you can see on the y-axis, that's American shad landing. So that's commercial catches in millions of pounds. And you can see from the 1950s to 2018, uh, the decrease that we've seen uh, along the entire East Coast. And some of that is due to uh, harvest restrictions uh, that went into place in the early 2000s, but it, it more reflects the fact that the East Coast populations up and down the East Coast are really at, at very 
low levels of abundance at this at this time. And so that that is con, uh, cause for concern, obviously. And some of the factors that may be responsible for that, that includes uh, loss of habitat, ocean bycatch, habitat changes, climate change, there are fish passage uh, alterations with habitat and concerns associated with that as well. Next slide, please. So in the Connecticut River Basin, I mentioned we have the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission. The, the state and federal agencies since 1967 have worked collaboratively uh, to restore anadromous fish. That's transitioned now to include American eel. And, and so oftentimes the term is diadromous fish restoration. So uh, we, we have a, an American shad management plan that's posted on my, my website. Um, we, uh, that's a revised updated plan that was produced in 2017. We have an, a, an addendum that was approved uh, this past spring that deals with fish passage performance measures. Uh, that, that's been approved. And you can see in the middle panel, uh, the range of American shad within the Connecticut River Basin, which Bellows Falls is the most upstream extent. That's the, the known historic extent of American shad. And that's uh, at river kilometer 280, which is a distance I, uh, that's about 175 miles upstream. You can see there are a lot of dams in the river system uh, that shad need to navigate. And you can see, uh, for example, Holyoke Dam, that's the first main stem dam. That's at river mile about 85. And uh, about half the habitat for American shad is located downstream of that. Of course, we also want to get shad into tributary systems as well. Uh, that's very important. And um, really what we're, we're seeking to do is restore them to their historic habitat. Uh, so we want range, we want to inter get them back uh, to their full range and increase abundances for those benefits, as I talked about, ecological benefits and also for fisheries and, and many other benefits as well. Uh, next panel. There. So here's a, here's a little more data. You can see uh, annual passage counts in the Connecticut River. Holyoke Dam is again the first fish uh, passage facility, first barrier. And you can see in 1976, we use that oftentimes as a starting point because that's when a second fish lift was installed. So the, the numbers are not really comparable going back in time. And there's been other changes that have made as well. But, but we often, when we show a time series, we'll show from 1976 on. And you can see these data actually show that uh, over the full time series, there's no trend associated with those numbers, but you can see um, how they have varied from year to year. Uh, I will say that since, two th since uh, 2005, if you look at those data since then, we have had a, a consistent uh, significant increasing trend. The long-term average uh, for shad past at Holyoke is about 310,000 shad. And that's about half the number we have in our management plan for, for a target number. I've also included the next upstream barrier, which is the Turner's Falls Dam. And you can see those, those fishways, there's three there that went, they were constructed and became effective in 1980. And the power company followed the designs and operational guidance that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, provided. And the data, uh, the information level at that time just wasn't very good on how to pass these fish. Um, and so they followed what we had asked, uh, they installed them, and, and those fishways just never really worked effectively. Um, and so we, we have, uh, you know, a, a fish passage issue there that we all recognize it's, it's an issue, and, and we're in the midst of the FERC relicensing process, and so we're going to be looking uh, to work with the power company um, in the FERC process to get better uh, up and downstream fish passage at that facility. Next slide. Okay, this is the final slide before we get to the video. So I mentioned the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, this summer, we just completed a two-year stock assessment process. There was a lot of information, uh, researchers and biologists up and down the East Coast. I was one of the, the uh, team members on this. We, it's, a, it's a large document. It's over uh, 1,400 pages, I believe. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a important body of work looking at the status and trends of the populations up and down the East Coast, and that's available on the website. Uh, we also have a management plan through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. That was approved in 2010. That required that any states that want to have, or jurisdictions that want to have fisheries need to have sustainable fish management plans. So I serve on the technical committee 
uh, for these species at uh, River Herring as well, along with many other agency people. And um, we, we've got a lot going on up and down the East Coast uh, in, in terms of uh, habitat plans that, are, that are, need to be renewed and other things. So again, I just to, to, to better stress how, how these species are managed both at that river basin level and then at this broader uh, full East Coast level. And really at this East Coast level, that's where uh, whether or not harvest is gonna be allowed is approved at that, at that much broader scale. Next uh, panel, please. Okay, and hit it one more time. Okay, so as part of uh, the ASMFC program, the technical committee and the management plans, it's important to have long-term monitoring data. It's all about status and trends of these populations. We know that the, le the you know, we wanna know uh, relative to goals, uh, you know, are we achieving them? Uh, you know, are there declines in population? And not just, uh, whether or not what, what is going up or down, what, it, what is it? Is it tied to juvenile production? Is it tied to age structure, size of fish, abundance? They're, these are all different things that are important for managers to track um, and have a good sense statistically and through a, a scientific method, uh, methods what's going on. So one of the very important uh, metrics that are part of the management plan that we've, uh, we have in place is to monitor juvenile production. And so the state of Connecticut since 1978 has monitored seven index sites downstream of Holyoke Dam. So you can see that's with a, a SANE net and these seven sites are sampled from July through October. And you can see the data down below, that's a geometric mean, but you can just see how, how production has varied over time. Well, the CRASC, uh, which Connecticut is certainly a member of, we, we felt it was important to expand that effort to upstream areas, upstream of Holyoke Dam. And that's what uh, you'll see in the video today, that I'm working with the state of Massachusetts uh, and other people. Uh, you know, Vermont certainly helps with it, but you know, we're using, you know, I use my boat and we, we sample sites randomly selected. We do this work from April, we're going out tonight through the fall, and we're looking at, again, the same sort of thing. What, what type of production is occurring relative to how many fish were uh, passed upstream what are some of the factors driving those uh, production numbers, the size, and how, so, and how it varies over space and time. And so, uh, and I, again, do that with Mass Fish and Wildlife, and we get help from, from CRC and other people uh, to uh, make up some of the field crew. Now, the video you'll see uh, is uh, just one person netting. Uh, typically, you know, the way the study was designed in, in 2017 was, is to have two people netting at the bow of the boat. Uh, and the work is done at dusk because that's when the, the fish come closer to the surface and are more susceptible to that electrofish sampling gear. And so with that, um, I think I'll uh, end this part of the, the slideshow. We can watch the video and then we'll have that question and answer period. All right, welcome to World Fish Migration Day. I'm Andy Fisk and I'm here in Holyoke, Massachusetts on the banks of the Connecticut River. I'm part of the team at the Connecticut River Conservancy and we're helping to celebrate World Fish Migration Day. And I'm also here in my role as a member of a really unique four state compact for the Connecticut River watershed. That's states and federal agencies and the public that's designed to help bring back the shad populations. And I'm here with Ken Sprankle, the Connecticut River Coordinator with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because we're going to go out and uh, electrofish. So Ken, what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're doing something that's done up and down the East Coast. It's a monitoring program to assess juvenile production. And so the state of Connecticut has been monitoring juvenile shad production since the 1970s downstream of Holyoke Dam. In 2017, my office in the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, through the Connecticut River Salmon Commission uh, determined we really needed to expand that monitoring program. So what we're looking to do is assess abundance, growth rates, and look at changes over space and time. And so this is done up and down the East Coast as part of uh, you know, the data that's used to help manage and restore American shad populations. And so we, we started this work in 2017. My office generally covers uh, up to the historic extent uh, the range of shad, which is Bellows Falls. And the state of Massachusetts covers uh, from Holyoke Dam to Turner's Falls. And as I mentioned, Connecticut does work uh, downstream of Holyoke Dam through Connecticut. And, and those data are used. We've got reports. Uh, and it ultimately, 
feeds into a much broader uh, program, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Because these spe this species migrates uh, in the ocean, it it's managed uh, cooperatively by the states from Florida to Maine and includes the federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So what's going on with the shad population here in the, the Connecticut River? My, my impression is it's uh, there could be a whole lot more fish in the river. So how does this relate to bringing more fish back to the Connecticut River? So, so as Andy knows, in his position with the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission, we have uh, an American shad management plan uh, that we uh, developed in 2017, an updated plan. And what we're looking to do is, as a minimum target, get 1.7 million fish back to the river mouth every year. And based upon available habitat, as we've determined through our assessments, upstream of Holyoke, we want to pass an average of over 600,000 shad at Holyoke. The long-term average of shad passage annually at the Holyoke Fish Lift since 1976 is about 310,000 shad. And we've been averaging that in recent years, so we've kind of been holding steady. So we want to see a whole lot more shad past Holyoke where we are today. So what are we going to be doing uh, on this boat tonight? So this boat, this is a, a specialized piece of equipment. It uses pulse uh, direct current. We're going to uh, put anode uh, umbrella rigs, we call them, which you'll see. They swing around front and it puts pulse DC into the water and will temporarily stun fish. And unlike net gear, we can actively go out and, and cover habitat. And we, we are able to better design our studies uh, because we have mobility with this particular gear, sampling gear. This information is going to help us do what? It's going to help us with management and restoration because we're looking to get more fish to the upper basin and increase resilience from the population. Right now, fish passage is impeded about halfway up in the basin, and we're going to, through the FERC regulatory process, improve passage rates. And the data we're gathering is showing that, in fact, we're getting lots of good juvenile production in those upper reaches, but the numbers are very, very low. And the population that's restricted downstream of that particular area, there's density dependent effects because there are too many fish. So uh, we wanna get these fish spread out throughout their historic range, um, and that, that helps with the population. That's great. So the baby fish are gonna give us information so we can get more shed in the Connecticut River. Thanks for caring about fish and coming out for World Fish Migration Day. Hi everybody, it's Ron Rhodes from the Connecticut River Conservancy and I have the pleasure of introducing Leo Will. Leo is a fisheries biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, normally out of the Springfield office, like many of us, she's not in the office these days. Um, she's been a tremendous help to CRC in our fish migration, fish passage work. Leo has brought several dam removal projects and culvert replacement projects to us, uh, connected us with those landowners and helped us get the funding to do those. Uh, she, she spends a lot of time on trout fisheries issues, but she is also involved with fish passage and fish habitat improvement for the species that we're talking about today, American shad, American eel, and one of our favorites, the sea lamprey. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lael. Okay, I just had to unmute myself. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as Ron had mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on the Connecticut River anadromous uh, population of sea lamprey. Uh, every year we typically will send out a press release because a lot of folks don't know that the uh, state of Vermont is home to two separate populations of sea lamprey. They are the same species, uh, but they're separate populations. So a lot of people associate the sea lamprey in the Connecticut River with the nuisance population over in Champlain. And so the goal for this video and some data that we're gonna show after is just to highlight you know, their ecological uh, benefits, um, give a presentation a little bit on their biology and the work that Vermont's doing uh, to help this species. Um, and then after we'll talk about uh, questions and try and clarify, clarify anything for folks that are on the line. So with that, I guess we can start the video. My name 
name is Leo Will. I'm one of the fisheries biologists out of the Springfield District. I'm here with Courtney Buckley, the other fisheries biologist out of the Springfield District. And today we are down at the Vernon Fish Ladder. Um, this is technically our counting room. Each year we count uh, the sea lamprey, American shad, and American eel, and historically Atlantic salmon passing through the Vernon Fish Ladder. <clears throat> so from here, we have a video monitoring system that we actually count these fish passing upstream. Um, and that's an indicator every year of how many fish pass a project, if the fish ladder is operating correctly, um, and it's really an indicator of our population. These uh, sea lamprey come in from the, um, into the Connecticut River. They have to pass Holyoke Dam as well as Turner's Falls to get up to Vernon. And they will go all the way up to, to the White River, which is just downstream of the Wilder Dam. So that whole migration is over 100 miles. <clears throat> Sea lamprey are one of our more primitive fish in the Connecticut River. They're actually a native species. Um, they've been around for 300 million years. And one thing that people don't really know is that the anatomist population in the Connecticut River, they actually stop feeding and are not parasitic once they enter the fresh water. So these fish come up the river, they go into the tributaries, they spawn, and then they die. And those carcasses provide uh, really valuable marine-derived nutrients into the which has shown to increase local productivity. Um, right now, <clears throat> these fish are on their way out. So usually by this stage, they're blind. They start getting a little bit of fungus on them. Their bodies start you know, shutting down right before they spawn. We know that <clears throat> these fish spawn in tributaries like the Black River and the West River. We've been working with Great River Hydro um, under the FERC relicensing to um, better accommodate other species um, that use the fish ladder. The other species that you'll see passing through here is the American Shad. Uh, it's a very popular commercial and recreational sport fish. Um, right now, the regulations is catch and release only on the Connecticut River and the, on the Vermont and New Hampshire side. Um, but again, we count these fish um, because they go past Vernon and they spawn in the Vernon impoundment up to the Bell Falls uh, Dam. Um, other species also use this ladder. Uh, you'll see some bass coming by. We had a huge carp that went by uh, the last time I was down here. Um, walleye and sucker use it uh, earlier in the springtime when they're making their spawning run. So we do see other species using this fish ladder as well. And one other thing I wanted to mention about the sea lamprey is currently right now we don't have a lot of information on their distribution throughout the watershed. So we've been partnering up with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Forest Service, um, New Hampshire Fish and Game, and UMass uh, professors over there to um, come up with a sampling regime where we can then identify their distribution. And one of the ways that we're going to be doing that is through eDNA. So Vermont Fish and Wildlife Biologists will be working with UMass to go out and collect samples for eDNA, which we would then go out and do a full-blown survey to identify um, spawning concentrations and the abundances of those spawning concentrations throughout the, um, throughout the watershed. So eDNA technology is something um, that's been emerging. It's been around for a while, but it's really been, uh, picked up in the fisheries world. And what happens is, is that these animals will fluff off their DNA into the water. We can then collect that water, and what actually happens is that water goes through a filter. So the filter is actually what has the DNA on it. They can then run that DNA and determine what species that DNA came from. Um, this is a new technology in the fisheries world, so the original um, plan is to go out and test known locations and abundances so that we can cross-reference that to make sure that we're not going to get your false negatives. Um, so if you do see a sea lamprey um, out in your backyard creek, um, please don't disturb them. They are a, a native population in the Connecticut River. They're also considered to be a species of greatest conservation need. They are not the nuisance population that you would see in the Champlain drainage. They're two separate populations. This is the anatomist population. So we have been putting out posts to remind uh, the public to not disturb them while they're So we're just going to talk a little bit about how we do our video monitoring. 
And this setup is we basically use a camera that has a little light, so at nighttime we can still see the counting window without getting a big glare. So what happens is that we take live video that goes from the camera, then goes to a converter box, and then gets transferred over to the computer, which has a program on it called Xamitol. This program was originally designed for salmon, but has been modified through the years um, to also trigger for other species. And we do that by changing some of the parameters on the software so that it's more sensitive to other, other species like your lamprey or your shad. Um, so what this does is rather than having all the video, it's only taking clips of when a, when a fish passes, so it cuts down the amount of time that you're reviewing bubble work. So this year, um, every year is different in terms of the number of fish that we see, as well as the timing of it. Um, I think this year, so far, it looks to be a good start for both the American Shad and the Sea Lamprey. Numbers at Holyoke look to be really good. Um, right now, this past spring, it has been very low flow and warmer temperatures. So that may be impacting their ability to move up in these big floods that we're seeing right now. So this is my first lamprey. It appears to be, oh, I don't know, a little bit right across from the doghouse bar. Um, he was just getting swept downstream. I'm gonna try and get a little bit of underwater on him. Okay, uh, so the next portion of this is just to talk about a little bit about what we're seeing in the fish ladders and how uh, <clears throat> that data is being used. Uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife has been uh, monitoring these fish ladders since their operation uh, began in the early 80s. And so the take home message um, with this slide, this is just some data um, from the Vernon fish ladder back in 2019. Um, I don't have this year's data up yet, but the take home message of this is just, you know, we have a, a typical bell shaped curve with their passage at Vernon, but it's a really short time frame. So you're talking, you know, uh, early June through early July. So three to four week period, all those fish have moved through the ladder. Um, and you tend to see this big, you know, bell shaped curve, a um, couple stragglers on either end, but that's a, that's a standard, uh, analysis of what we see on an annual basis is that bell-shaped curve. So you can do that next slide. And this is, uh, the bottom of my screen is cutting off, but I believe the green line uh, is the sea lamprey line and then the gray line <clears throat> is the American shad. And as you can see, there, there is a lot of annual variability with a couple of, you know, spikes in the middle. Um, earlier on in the 80s, not a lot of sea lamprey, a couple spikes. And then the past few years, we did start to see an increase, which has kind of leveled off. So again, a lot of annual variability with passage at Vernon. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then this is basin-wide uh, counts. And so this is at a log scale. Um, again, 
you know, these are counts. Uh, the blue line at the top is Holyoke um, from 1976 to 2016. Um, again, ranging between 14,000 and 97,000. So that is a lot of variability. Uh, take home message with this is that, you know, although we see a lot of annual variability, the population is considered to be stable. Um, and then all the, the different lines there are just the different facilities with counts. Um, and Bellows Falls, you can see the, the purple with the X's on it. You know, those gap, those are just data gaps when um, the fish ladder was not operating. And then the green line again is just a duplicate of what was shown before uh, for annual passage where you see those spikes. But you don't see a major decline. Um, you don't see a major uptick. It's, it's fairly stable, even though there is a lot of that annual variability. And that was it for that one. Great. Wow. This has been a lot of great information, Lael and Ken. Thank you so much. I, I always find it such a privilege to be able to get under the water and be down there and see these fish that I, I've actually never seen live. So that was awesome. Um, a couple people are starting to put questions in the chat box. I please encourage people to do so. Um, there were two questions, which it looks like Ken answered them. I don't know, Ken, if you want to... Um, <coughs> just ex say anything out loud about that. So the first question was about uh, whether the shad spawn once or first time in the Connecticut River or might they spawn in another river another time? So yeah, thanks for the question. So um, I mentioned quickly that, uh, it, that there's very little strain that's been documented and that, that's something we revisited as part of that big coastwide stock assessment. So it'd be very, very unlikely uh, there is a very limited small amount of strain that occurs and that strain of course would be more commonly associated with nearby systems um, and in the Connecticut River you know the, uh, the Pawtucket and Thames River have very small small numbers of fish so even though we have these you know relatively large numbers coming up the Connecticut River we don't see any uh, you know any uh, related effects uh, that would be tied to, hey, there's a lot of fish in the Connecticut River and we saw a bump over in these other systems. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And, and the, the repeat spawners have declined and, and uh, it's due to a number of factors that we can't pinpoint. Um, could be you know, out migration survival for those fish from the time they need to leave the river system. They're, they're living off of uh, energy reserves. They're not feeding. So uh, it could be uh, environmental conditions for fish that get upstream of dams. It could be impacts from being upstream of dams that don't have good downstream passage. And then of course they're out in the marine environment. So, um, you know, bycatch, other climate issues. So it, it's, it could be uh, due to a, a suite or a combination of any factors. Great. And there was another question from Dave. Is there a relation between the juvenile index and subsequent adult recruitment? Yeah, which is a good, it's a, it's a great question. These are things that we look at. I didn't answer it correctly. I kind of jumped. I have in my head one of the studies that uh, had been published, which is a, a, a different relationship. It was tied to the number of adults that come back to the river system and spawn and that's and what they produce. And that was what I had uh, replied with. So um, that relationship no longer exists. To, 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 be, to get back on Dave's question, um, no, that, that's, a, that's always, that's kind of like a, a holy grail. And because the Connecticut River, um, as I said, the adult numbers uh, relative to the, the fishway counts have not um, varied in, in any consistent way. There's somewhat a, a random noise. Um, and those juvenile numbers have also been um, kind of been without trend largely. Uh, we, do, we don't have any detectable relationship. I think you know, those, those sorts of relationships are, are more easily detected at very low, low levels of abundance of adults or very, very high levels. And so the Connecticut River, we're, we're not really in, in that range uh, for the data we have. And, and we don't, we aren't able to, we don't have, haven't been able to detect that. Although, um, you know, it's understood that there, there is, uh, likely some some relationship there just not detectable 
great. Um, thanks, Ken. Um, again, people can ask a question in the chat box or since we're all uh, available by um, just you can unmute yourself as well if you want to just raise your hand and ask a question we're happy to do anything live and maybe Andrea or Ron or any any of the other partners have some questions they want to ask I'll just um, mentioned that uh, I've always thought it was kind of funny that when you go to the Holyoke um, viewing area, the sea lamp ray are kind of crashing into the window. Um, and Lael, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of the life history and, and that they're mostly, their bodies are shutting down when they're passing upstream. Yeah, yeah. I, t I talked a little bit about that in the video where they, mm -hmm. they start, you know, um, said they stop feeding once they enter the fresh water. Um, and similar to salmon, you know, I used to work with salmon on the West Coast for quite a few years. Um, you know, they, they will start to get the fungus on them. Usually by the time they get to Vernon, they're blind. Um, so there is a lot of, you know, when we put out a press release in the springtime, we've been getting a lot of comments of, well, are the sea lamprey gonna attack humans that are, you know, potentially swimming in the river? And that's not the case. Um, they completely stop feeding. We have no record, um, no documentation of any sea lamprey attacking humans. Um, and in fact, the juvenile life stage, what we call the amicetes, um, that are rearing in the freshwater, actually detritivores, they don't actually have that sucking disc at that time. Um, they get that sucking disc um, when they start to make their migration back out to the ocean. Um, and then, you know, the populations are said to be more in balance because they have uh, more of a food resource in the ocean relative to Champlain. Um, they're also predated upon more often in the ocean than, than in freshwater. Um. Great. Um, there's yeah, a question from... Oh, like sorry. food on the lower deer field and hovered over a sea lamprey and they, they don't even know you're there because they're blind at that point, right? Yeah, and I uh, used to do some work with the Pacific lamprey out on the west coast as well and I kind of get the sense that they are so in tune with spawning that they're really just not paying attention to what's going on around them. They, they're on a mission to get their nest built to, to spawn and so you know, I've seen them in very shallow water out on the West Coast, and they're just busy doing their deed. Great. Um, maybe Lael and or Ken, can you talk a little bit about the current relicensing and possible opportunities to increase the health of both sea lamprey and shad populations as a result of that? Kathy would like us to talk about. <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the FERC relicensing process began uh, back in 2012, and they're relicensing all five projects at the same time. Um, so that's Turner's Falls, Northfield Pump Storage, uh, Vernon, Bellows, and Wilder. Uh, so it's been a lot of work for the stakeholders um, to manage that sort of workload. Um, but we actually did get a lot of really good information from those FERC studies. I think, you know, comprehensively to look at everything out there is a huge information resource. Um, right now we are, you know, working with the hydro um, to improve uh, not only, you know, fish passage, but also the flow regime on the Connecticut River. So it, it's more protective uh, during sensitive life stages, such as uh, the spawning life stage and rearing. Um, so that's an ongoing effort. I don't see it, um, you know, coming to, to closure anytime soon because a lot of the fish passage issues will need to be worked out, um, you know, because there's going to be a lot of engineering part to that as well. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. That was good, Lael. Um, relative to fish passage, you know, it's both upstream and downstream. Again, the adults can get upstream, we wanna get them back out to the ocean if they're able to, to head back downstream. Um, and uh, as Lael said, there's also flow. Uh, and there's also thing, other protections. Protections meaning uh, as they're coming 
downstream, you know, uh, depending on the size of the fish and the turbines, again, it, it gets into these studies. Uh, generally speaking, turbine passage is not a, is not a preferred route for fish, uh, certainly. Uh, so we want to, you know, exclude them from that route uh, nearly in all cases. And upstream, I talked about how Turner's Falls uh, project in, in the 1980s, when the designs were being actually uh, uh, going on in the 70s. Again, that, that gain in information, there's been a lot of information that we've learned on uh, the swimming ability of these fish, uh, proper designs relative to turbulence, uh, energy, attraction uh, flows for the fish. And so, you know, we're looking to utilize all that information that we've gained to, to uh, really improve upstream passage. And, and we can also use that information that's been gained over time to better protect fish going downstream. And so, you know, we're going to use the, the FERC process uh, for that. Great. Um, Kathy or any of the CRC folks who are also working on the FERC relicensing, if you want to share anything more from the CRC side. Well, um, <laughs> I can just add that um, you know, CRC has been participating in the relicensing from the very beginning, um, submitting study requests, looking at the study plans, reviewing the studies, and then as we enter into the sort of license parameter stage, um, certainly are interested in uh, improved upstream passage at Turner's Falls um, and downstream passage safe and effective and timely passage. Um, also, we haven't talked about eels, but that's another uh, migratory fish species that is out in the river. And currently there, um, Vernon's been setting up some eel passage, but prior to the relicensing studies, there really is an official eel passage at Turner's Falls. So that'll be exciting to see. There is, um, the Holyoke Dam, as a result of that relicensing in the early 2000s, um, has uh, a number of different ways of passing eels. Some of them are ladders to um, holding tanks, and then the, um, the tanks get emptied upstream of the Holyoke Dam. There's also uh, the old fish ladder on the South Hadley side. Um, passes fish to a tank, right? It doesn't, yeah, to a tank that then needs to be emptied at the same place. That, um, it's been interesting just uh, to figure out where to put these little eel ladders, um, taken many, many years um, to fine tune it, and they've got a system that pretty much works. Um, so for Turner's Falls, there were um, studies that put, and they put out um, eel ladders. So I'm assuming that with the new license, there'll be a, a lot of like sort of learn and tweak. Um, and uh, I think that um, for in terms of fall fish <laughs> migration day, there um, there are eels moving downriver um, during the fall. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And for Northfield Mountain, um, I believe the, the study showed that there was a bit of a concern with downstream migrating um, juvenile shad and the downstream migrating eel in terms of getting uh, sucked up into the turbines there. Um, the study showed that upstream migration wasn't as much of a that much of a delay or worry so in general there's a lot of little pieces to it but um i think we're aiming to have uh improved passage and reduced uh what's called entrainment and impingement into the, the turbines kathy i don't know if you want to add anything to that I 
I would rather, there's a few other questions that popped up in the chat and I, I think, um, you know, it'd be good to respond to those. Okay, yeah, there's two more and we can handle those in our time remaining. So for Leo, um, on one of your plots, you, it showed American eel as going negative on the plot and can you explain a little bit about why? Yeah, yeah, um, historically we, we didn't count American eel because the biologists at that time uh, felt that the, the numbers were inaccurate. Um, last year, I believe it was, um, you know, we were seeing the negatives of, as well. And so to explain that, uh, in the video where you saw that, that viewing window is not actually at the top of the ladder. Um, I think it's about a little more than halfway up the ladder. There's another section of the ladder that goes upstream of the counting window. So what the way that we count is once a fish actually passes that upper pane is when they count them. And so we have pluses and minuses that we have to do because you see fallback, meaning that, and Shad do this as well, meaning that they will pass upstream and then they'll fall back downstream. So we have to keep track of those movements. We're basically tracking those movements of moving up or moving down. So when you see those negatives, that just means that we tracked more downstream movements than upstream movements. We don't actually know the number that pass, you know, that exit outside the ladder. Um, so what happened last year, I think it was last year, Ken, they did a um, pits tag study with eel to figure out what was going on. They tried to seal off some areas within the ladder because eel are notorious for getting everywhere. Um, so there were some gaps that they could kind of get into these different areas where we, wouldn't, we weren't able to get an accurate count. So they went ahead and sealed off those areas. They also did a pit tag study, which basically allows you to see where that fish is moving. They, they tag them and, the, and you can see where that fish is moving throughout the ladder. And so we did find based off of that study that there are some problems within the ladder of some of these fish. Um, I won't get into the engineering side of things, but they will uh, inadvertently get dumped back out into the tail race. And so they're making multiple runs within that ladder. Um, I made the decision this year to not even do those counts because it is very time consuming to do those counts. And at the end of the day, it's just not an accurate representation of what's actually passing out of the ladder. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we have time for this one last question. Um, I understand, Shad, we're, no, we're not allowed to migrate upstream in the Susquehanna River this year because of invasive snakeheads being downstream. Can you comment if there are any plans in place if snakeheads invade the Connecticut River? So we don't, we don't have a plan in place. Uh, certainly, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, unfortunately it's kind of reactive. Uh, I, you know, um, uh, as far as their, the extent of their range right now, I think they've, uh, they might be in the canal system that connects to the Delaware River. And I, I believe that's the northernmost extent. I, I'll, I can listen to somebody else if they could tell me differently. So they are several river systems away from us. And I think uh, should they, um, you know, continue to move northward, um, it will be something we would need, certainly need to discuss. And it, it is an issue, uh, obviously, uh, for the Susquehanna. I, I can't uh, really say anything yes. more than that. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I just want to let folks know a few things. Um, uh, CRC has a community science program and one of them is uh, counting sea lampreys in their nests and you can find out more about the, that our community science programs on our website. They will be sharing a bunch more resources in an email following up with this conversation, um, some links, how to get involved, um, and other volunteer opportunities. So for now, I guess I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us for this uh, wonderful live stream. A special thanks to Lael and Ken for sharing your time and expertise, and to Andrea and Ron for leading us off, and for everyone for sharing your questions and thoughts. And we hope you'll continue to follow up with us. Catch our next live stream is going to be on tires. 
um, we're tired of tires and we're doing a trash talk on 11 on 11 on November 18th. So um, you can check out that for more information also at noon. And then we'll be on pause with live stream until the new year. So we hope you'll come back and um, in, get involved with us on other issues that we're working on and um, come out for more events. So thank you so much for all for being here today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Great. <laughs>